Last week, I shared with you guys that potentially we may take a little detour from 1 Corinthians this week, and in keeping with that, we are going to take a, a brief detour. I do uh, trust that next week we'll be back in 1 Corinthians, uh, but this week we're going to be in a different text, and I, I just trust that the Lord has something for us in that. Last Sunday uh, in the afternoon, we had a, a members meeting, uh, a gathering uh, of the, the church here at Calvary, and uh, in that time, uh, the church elected two more deacons to serve this body. And so I, I think it's a very appropriate time for us to take a look at what, what is the office of deacon. We recognize that as an office within the church, a, a deacon as well as pastor elder. Those words are synonymous in the New Testament. And so I think it would be appropriate this morning to take a little time, dig into what does that role look like? I think that can be fruitful for the new guys coming on, but I think it can also be fruitful for the guys that have served as deacons previously or maybe currently. But also this, I, I think any time we as a church body take a look at the roles and responsibilities rooted in Scripture and, and take the opportunity to examine ourselves and see, are, are we lined up here? How are we doing with regards to this? I think that's a good thing. Because it, it gives us an opportunity for encouragement, one, if we see, okay, we're doing really well at this. Or if there's a, a place for adjustment, we can do that. And anytime we look more and more like the New Testament church, I think that's a good thing, and I think God's honored in that. And I think He blesses in that. And so I, I just trust that God's going to do something through this. And uh, I hope, tell you what, let me, let me go ahead and open with a word of prayer, or open this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin to look at the Scripture for this morning, all right? Let me pray for us. Father, again, I, I thank You for this morning that You've given us. It is a gift, and I pray we consider it as such. You didn't have to allow the air to enter into our lungs, but You did. And so, Father, I just pray that we would not take today for granted. We would take advantage of the time that You've given us, that we might be faithful. Lord, that we would walk in humble obedience, that, that we as a faith family here at Calvary might accurately reflect the church that, that You desire us to be. Lord, that, that we grow up into the, the image, the standard that is Christ, grow us in maturity. And Lord, for those outside this church, and I don't simply mean just outside physically, but maybe they're they're, they're here, they're among us, but they're not believers. They're not a part of the church. Lord, I pray that you might do a work this morning to draw them to yourself. Lord, we desire this community to grow as brothers and sisters, as a faith family, that more might come into the family. So, Father, do that work today. Lord, we love you. Lord, I need you. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, so when we begin to consider or think about the role of a, a deacon or a pastor elder, we probably think over towards 1 Timothy. It's a, a letter that Paul writes to young Timothy, and, and he lists out some qualifications. And so we have very clear qualifications for each one of these roles. And when we consider the way the New Testament and we look at it, we, we can see pretty clearly how some of these offices work. You think about pastor elder, and there's quite a bit of scriptural weight and commendation and various things that, that are written down saying, hey, this is how this operates. You exhort, you administer the Word, you shepherd, you equip, all of these things. So we, we get a pretty good picture of what that role looks like, pastor, elder. Again, synonymous terms. But what about a deacon? We have very clear qualifications, but with regards to what the nature of the role looks like, it, it's not quite as clear scripturally. We don't, we don't have as many examples of that. And you know, I, I think God in His wisdom did that on purpose. Because consider this. Let's say you go to ten different churches in our community. And let's say they're all biblical, faithful churches recognizing pastor elders and then deacons. Chances are, each one of those churches you go into, if you look at tangibly what the deacons do, each one is probably going to have a bit of a different role, right? They're going to serve the body in a different way. 
Most likely. Now, hopefully all of the same nature, hopefully those uh, individuals of the same qualifications, but each church family has different needs. And so those deacons serve in different capacities, serving those needs. And so there's, there's a lot of breadth within this role and what this might look like, okay? That said, I, I do think there's a text that we can go to this morning that, that helps define this nature, this role, how it operates under this particular banner, okay? So if you have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to go over to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 is where we're heading. Now let me give us a little context because we are jumping in uh, six chapters in. All right, There's five chapters prior to this, of course. And so there's a lot that's been happening here in the book of Acts. The church at Jerusalem is birthed. You have Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is poured out. The church is just explosive in its growth in Jerusalem. A lot of things are happening. Persecution has already begun to take place on some level. In fact, the chapter before, you see uh, some of the apostles being imprisoned and then also beaten or flogged. E even so, let me just back up. This, this, just, this is rich, so that's why I want to read it. Um, this isn't in my notes at all, but it's just good. This is chapter 5, verse 40. They took the advice, uh, his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for His name. So they get beat and then they leave singing praises and rejoicing. Like that's just the New Testament church and how they function, right? This taking joy in sufferings. We talked a little bit about that last week, how the path of obedience often has suffering. I'm totally getting off my notes, but that's really good, okay? So just linger in that. I encourage you to do so. So the church is growing Persecution's happening, and you get to chapter 6. And look with me here. We're just going to unpack this, make some observations, and, and I think uh, I just trust the Lord's going to have something for us here. Let me, let me read the text as a whole. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then I sense the need to pray again, and then we'll unpack this a little at a time. It says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of, of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Permaeus, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. Father, again, I thank You for Your Word, Lord, I trust that it will never return void. We can trust that because your scripture says that. It always accomplishes exactly what you'd have set for it to accomplish. So, Father, I pray that you might give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That's in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's, let's begin to look at this. Chapter 6. It says, Now at this time while the disciples were increasing in number. So again, the church is growing. That's a good thing. They're increasing day after day after day. And here, here's a reality that we need to see. With growth comes potential problems. And I don't mean problems in a negative way, just there, there's issues that have to be addressed or resolved with growth. Because directly connected with this growth is what's happening next, the situation. It says, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, the church here in Jerusalem seems to have continued in the work of what was happening in the synagogues. The synagogues would often take care of widows, those that were uh, unable to take care of themselves. Maybe they didn't have family to support them. And so they would make sure they were well-fed, that they were taken care of. The church seems to have been doing that same thing. 
And as the church at Jerusalem has grown, you can imagine the number of widows is also growing. So the church is growing and growing and growing. And as it grows, some gaps begin to surface. What well, once they were able to administer and take care of and make sure everyone was well taken care of, well, some oversight begins to happen, some, some overlooking, some neglect, if you will. Notice it says, their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of the food. So some of the people, in particular the Hellenistic Jews, so they're Greek-speaking, culturally they're a little different, and probably because of that they're getting left out. Now there's nothing malicious in this text, nothing to suggest that, that it's an intentional oversight, but the reality is there's a problem here. As the church grows, some people are getting left out. And notice someone rings the bell on this. They, they complain. They, a complaint arises. And I just want to say that's not a bad thing. It's bad that it happened, yes. It's not bad that they brought this to the attention of the church. Now, don't... Some of you might mishear me on this. Don't go home and tell your spouse, the pastor gave me permission to complain. That's not what I'm saying, okay? That's, that's not the case. But if you see something off, if you see something falling through the cracks, come tell us. Please do that. I've been here for like eight weeks, and so I assure you, I don't know everything that takes place in this church. And, and I dare say, probably a lot of the leadership, because of how dynamic this church family is, there's a lot of stuff that happens. There, there's things that could potentially fall through the cracks that we just miss. And so if you see something that's off, or we're missing something, come tell us. All right? That's okay. Please do that. Not that you need my permission, but you have it. All right? Come share that. Let us know. So a, a complaint arises. Now that's the context. That's the situation here in Jerusalem that's essentially going to give rise to this office of deacon. And we're going to begin to see a distinction between the two offices we recognize, that being a pastor, elder, and the deacon. And that's going to happen here in just a second. So let's, let's begin to dig into this in, chapter, in verse 2. It says, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It's not desirable for us to neglect the word in order the Word of God, in order to serve tables. Now, I've heard sermons preached where this is used in kind of a demeaning way, as though pastor elders are up high and they look down on deacons serving tables. That, that's not what this text is saying. We ought not understand it that way. We ought not read that into this text because that's not there. Rather, what's happening here, this is a response from the apostles. That's why he says it's not desirable for us to neglect the Word of God in order to serve tables. What had happened was, as this complaint arose, probably those same people went to the apostles and said, hey, can you fix this? Can you address this? Can, can you go and serve tables? We're being overwhelmed. There's, there's so much need within this body now. There's thousands and thousands of believers, probably hundreds of people that are partaking in the daily serving of food. The fact that they're going to select seven people to help with this task in a few minutes just shows the size of it. And so the apostles probably had been asked to do this. And they've considered can we do it? What's the cost? What's it going to take if, if we do this? Well, what they come to determine in their evaluation is if we do this, the ministry of the Word is going to suffer. For the apostles, that was their foremost responsibility. To proclaim, to administer the Word of God among the people of God. That, that's what they're even going to affirm in, in verse 4. We'll devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. They knew that that was their priority. And so in helping in this way to serve tables, they knew that this based off their time and the weight of the responsibility, they can't do both. And so they're saying that this 
primary function of ours is going to suffer if we do this. So you see the dilemma. They've got a real point here. There's a real responsibility to their calling that they have to be faithful to. But you also see there's a real need within this church in Jerusalem that needs to be addressed. It's valid. So what do you do? Well, look at verse 3. This is how they handle the situation. He says, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So what you see here is this emergence of the role of deacon. Now, I'll go ahead and just say, the word deacon doesn't show up here, okay? The noun doesn't. The verb does, all right, in, in verse 2. In a sense, they're deaconing. Can I say that? That doesn't make sense. They're, 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 they're doing the work of a deacon. There we go, we'll say it that way. Deaconing, what have you, all right. So they're doing that work. Remember, this is early on, early, early. Brand new church, just been birthed. What Paul's going to say decades later when he says so cleanly and clearly, okay, here's pastor, elder, here's deacon. He, he's got some time for this to develop. This is the very front end of it. It's just emerging. You're just beginning to see kind of this distinction between these two offices within the Lord's church. And so you begin to see that here. It says, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Their primary function here is going to be making sure this task is taken care of. Now, what kind of task is this? Fundamentally, it's a, a physical, administrative need within the church. That's what's taking place. It's a very real, tangible need within the church that needs to be met. And so that's what they're being tasked with, to take charge of this task, see that it's done well, and at the same time, it's working in concert with the apostles. Now, I would suggest that we can see the apostles here, their role, looking a lot like what's going to become pastor elder, okay? Now, there's not apostolic succession, anything like that, okay? But the fact that their priority is the administration of the Word, we see that also in a pastor-elder. That's one of the main requirements for a pastor-elder, that they're able to teach. They have to be able to administer the Word. Okay, That's not to say deacons can't. They can and often do. In fact, in just a few minutes, the, this list of these seven men, Stephen, very well-equipped teacher, he's an apologist, you, you, you go on, look at Philip. He's an evangelist, right? So these guys are very well equipped. But all that to say, these two offices begin to emerge here. You begin to see that. The pastor elder has a particular responsibility in the administration of the Word. It's not that a pastor elder doesn't do administrative work or work among, among the sheep. In fact, if you're going to be a shepherd, you have to be with the sheep. It's the only way that works, okay? But there can't be a negligence of the Word of God being administered. If, if I as a pastor, if I as your pastor, neglect this, I am not faithful. I can't be faithful if I'm neglecting the Word. There, there, there has to be certain priorities in, in the way in which we operate. So, so it is with the deacon, part of their role is to take on administrative responsibilities, felt needs, real physical needs within the church that work in concert with the pastor elder to release them to be free in the ministry of the Word. So you see how these two work hand in hand? You've got the pastor elder administering the Word, the deacon serving alongside in making sure the, the physical needs are met. And all of this is under the banner of the church. They're all serving the church. It's all for the church's good and health. For its, if I can say this word, for its prosperity in a sense, right? Now, keep going with me here. Let's, let's keep unpacking this. It says in verse 4, 
but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. So again, you see the distinction here in these two roles. Verse 5, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Pecorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte for Antioch. Now let me, let me shift our attention here for just a minute. We've got pastor, elder, we've got deacon. We're beginning to see the emergence of these two roles. But let me point out here the function of the congregation as well. Of the body of believers. Because remember, when, when all of this started, a problem came up, it came to the church leadership, and what did they do first thing? They got the church together. They, they summoned the whole body of believers. And as they introduce this potential solution, what, what does it say? Look at verse 5. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. It's not as though the apostles were lording over the church saying, this is how we're going to do it. No, they're saying, hey, I think this is how it ought to happen. And, and the body's saying, yeah, we approve that. Yeah, we're, we're good with that. Church, we're, we're congregationalists here at Calvary because of texts like this. We, we see the importance and the authority of God's church as a whole, corporately, as a regenerate body of believers. And so we begin to see this working out here. Look with me. It, it found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose... Now, that seems as though the ones choosing the deacons here was the church. It was the body. In fact, that's exactly what they had suggested to take place. He says in verse 3, Therefore, brethren, select from among you. So you have the church corporately selecting, nominating, if you will, their deacons, and then bringing them before, here it's going to be the apostles. Look what it says. It says, And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying... Now, Luke condenses a lot. Luke is our inspired author here. And so there's a lot of weight in verse 6. I don't know everything that happens there. I presume when he says they brought them before the apostles and after praying, I assume that means the apostles took some time, prayed over these men, and asked the question, do they meet the qualifications? There's a vetting, if you will, right? Because what was asked of them? That they be men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom. Now, that, that's a pretty good summation of what happens in 1 Timothy. And those qualifications are primarily character related. Are they of good character? Are they of good reputation? I, you know, I, I don't think it's accidental that the men that, that this church selected and elected last week, you've had the opportunity to see these guys for quite some time. They've been around here. How do you get to know somebody's character? You spend time with them. You get to know them. And so I, I believe what you have here, the congregation putting forward the individuals to serve in this capacity, the leadership saying, yeah, I agree with this, and then they laid their hands on them. Now what is that? We see it at a couple other places in the New Testament. Some of these laying on of hands in different situations. There's not any sort of impartation of a special gift to perform this ministry. That's not what's happening. I, I think what's happening here, and, and I believe this to be the body, the church, coming around and laying their hands on these guys. I, I don't think it's just the apostles. It, it's ambiguous. It could go either way. No, notice what it says. It says, they, so that being the whole body, brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands. So probably the church, could be the apostles, but I think it's probably the, the whole congregation doing this. I believe this to be a, a commissioning to the work. It's very similar to what you see happen with Paul and Barnabas when they're commissioned out of Antioch. They're commissioned to a task, to a particular service. They're representative of the body. 
And so what I'd like to do here in just a little bit, we're, we're going to have a, a time of response here in a moment, but at the end of our service, the way we're going to close today, I'm going to ask Felipe and Jose and their families to come up, and we're going to just close with a time of prayer over them and essentially commissioning them to the work of deacon, that, that they would serve faithfully, the Lord would give them wisdom, and that you as a church body recognize, hey, these are our deacons. We support them, we love them, we're going to encourage them. We're going to encourage them in the work, and we're setting them apart for this work. Now, let me, let me point this out as well. I mentioned a moment ago, all this happens in service to the church. The pastor elder serving the church. Now there's a mutual submission aspect that goes with pastor elder there, right? The deacon serving under the church, to the church. You might say that that's odd. You mean the Lord set up particular offices for the greater good, for the service of the body of Christ, for His church. That's the way this functions. That's weird. That's a little bit countercultural, right? Isn't that kind of strange how the Lord does that? I had the opportunity to, to set in on a, or be a part of a prayer group this week that was online. And one of the texts that came up in that, in that meeting uh, was actually over out of the book of John. It's John chapter 13. I just want to read this. John chapter 13. Picking up in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Church, we're marked, should be marked, by our love for one another. The way in which we love, the way in which we submit one to another, the way in which we humbly seek the good of one another, putting others' interest above that of our own, that should be a distinguishing characteristic of us as a body of believers. And it's something that the world outside looks in and says, that, that's weird. That's strange that the Lord set His church up that way. There's something really distinct and really different Notice he says, love as I have loved you. This is Jesus speaking. How is it that Jesus loved his church? He loved it sacrificially. He gave his life as a ransom for us. He came and lived a perfect, sinless life. Died the death that was meant for me and you. Why was it for me and you? Because the wages of sin is death. We were supposed to take that. We were condemned to death. And he took that. He took that. He paid that for us. And to those who confess, those who believe, those who follow Him, He gives the right to be called children of God. We can stand before God as holy and clean and blameless because of Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans, he says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Church, there's something very distinct about how a church ought to operate. And maybe you're a visitor here. Maybe you're watching online. I just want to invite you into this community, into this faith family. Just like what I, I just quoted from the book of Romans. If you confess, if you believe, you follow Him, you can be a part of this. Is it different? Yeah. Praise God for that. Church, I, I'm going to pray here in just a moment. And I know this is a little bit of a different service, a little different sermon time but I just want to encourage you. Check your heart. See where you are this morning. See where we are corporately. Are there some places that we can make some adjustments? Are there some things we can do to look more and more like the New Testament church that we see here in Acts? Take some time. Pray for your deacons. Pray for me as your pastor. We, we need wisdom. Pray for us. I hope that you will. And if you're on the outside looking in, I just want to invite you to come in this morning. Maybe you've never confessed your sin. Maybe you've never repented before God. And this morning, something's stirring in your heart. And you just feel anxious and your heart's about to beat out of your chest. And I'm not doing that to you. That, 
That's the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart this morning. I can't do that. The Holy Spirit does. You be obedient to what He's asking you to do this morning. I believe He's leading you to repent and say, Lord, I need You. Forgive me. Cleanse me. I want to be a part of this faith family. You be obedient this morning. Let me pray. I'm going to be outside. I'll be available. There'll be some other folks who would love to pray for you. And you just be obedient to what God's asking you to do this morning, all right? Let me pray for us. Father, again, I, I thank You for today. I thank You for Your church, Lord, that You've constructed, You've put together, and it's all on the foundation of the Lord Jesus. It's our chief cornerstone. Apart from Him, nothing stands. And so, Father, foremost, I, I just pray if there's any here under the sound of my voice that they don't know You this morning, that they might. I pray they would. I pray that You would just stir their hearts, bring them to repentance, or that they might confess their sin and say, Lord, I need You. I need forgiveness. I, I need grace. Lord, I pray that You might do that work today. And Lord, if we as a body here at Calvary, if there's some things that we can do to adjust, to look more and more like what You've designed Your church to be, Lord, I pray we'd be faithful in doing it. And Lord, in those places where we see we're doing really well, I pray we'd be encouraged, but we not be prideful in that. But Father, we just walk in continual humility and obedience, seeking to look more and more like You. Lord, I, I know the more that we align ourselves with Your desires and Your heart and what you, You'd have us to be, Lord, the more effective we're going to be for the kingdom, the more we're going to see You show up in, in huge, powerful ways. Lord, we desire that. We want to see You change this city the world in which we live, and we know that You can, and we know that You desire this. So Father, let us be found faithful. Let us walk in obedience. Lord, we love You, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen.